What's up, Porch? How are we doing tonight? Hey, it's so good to see you. Let me introduce myself to you. My name is Timothy Atik, and I am one of the teaching pastors here at Watermark, and I am so fired up to be with you here at the first porch of 2023. I know we've got a bunch of people right here in the room here in Dallas, but we've got people watching all over the nation. So just a quick shout out to those in Boise, Indianapolis, Greater Lafayette, Austin, Midland, Tulsa, Scottsdale, Cincinnati, Fort Worth, and Des Moines. We're so glad that you are tuning in. Tonight we're starting a new series, and here's what it's called. It's called The Return, Living Like Jesus is Coming Back. Here's what prompted the series. I was at dinner with some friends who were just sharing what God was doing in their lives. And and as I processed what they were saying, this thought popped into my mind. And here it is. I want you to just imagine this. If Jesus Christ were to walk through those doors right there, if he were to walk in here, we're going to hand him the microphone because he's Jesus. Like, I don't need the microphone anymore. Jesus is here. We'll just give it to him. But if Jesus were to walk through those doors and we were to give him a microphone, what would happen if Jesus walked in and said, hey guys, mark the calendars. One year from today, January 24th, 2024, I am coming back. Mark your calendars, start a timer, start a countdown. If Jesus were to walk in and say, I am letting you know, the Bible says that no one knows the day or time, but now you do. One year from today, I am coming back. What would change? Would anything change? Just think about that. If you knew with concrete certainty that one year from today, Jesus is coming back, what would you, what would you start doing? What would you stop doing? What would instantaneously become of greatest importance to you? Is there anything that you're doing now which would just become inconsequential and you would easily get rid of it? When I was growing up, I grew up in a Christian household and so there were different times when I was at church and they would talk about Jesus coming back and then my brother and I, we would watch these movies about Jesus coming back and like people would just disappear and then their clothes would just be left in their chairs. It was pretty freaky. I mean, freaked me out as a kid. But when I thought about Jesus coming back, there were different moments throughout my life where I began to think, you know what, I hope that I get to fill in the blank before Jesus comes back. So when I was younger, it was like, you know what, I really hope I get to go on the ski trip before Jesus comes back. And then when I got some hormones, I was like, I really hope I'm able to have sex before Jesus comes back. That's just full disclosure. Some of you all have had that thought too, but that's just the reality. Like I remember there was one time that I was in the middle of sin and I was like, I hope Jesus doesn't come back right now. I don't know if you've ever dealt with that. And even as I got into my mid-20s, it's like I I hope that I'm able to, to do something with my life before Jesus comes back. Do you have anything like that? Like maybe you'd position it as you you hope to get to to do something, you get hope to accomplish something before you you die. When I think back of, of those different thoughts of hoping that I would get to experience something before Jesus came back, well, what I realized is that all I wanted was, I, I was looking at what was right in front of me and all I wanted was the immediate satisfaction of whatever that pleasure was. But I'm talking about something much deeper here. I'm talking about something much greater. Like if we had the clarity that Jesus was going to come back January 24th, 2024, what would change? What would you start? What would you stop? Like it is my belief that radical change would happen across this room. Like I would imagine that there would be certain people in this room that you've had one foot in and one foot out with Jesus and you would finally say, I'm all in. Like you would finally fully surrender to Jesus. Jesus wouldn't just be a part of your life, he would be the passion of your life. 
I would imagine that there would be certain people that'd say, you know what, I'm finally going to start treasuring his word. I'm, I'm finally going to start meeting with God each day and talking to him and praying with him. I'm finally going to deal with that sin. I'm finally going to share my faith with that person at work that I've been too nervous to share with because I don't want to jeopardize the relationship. I think that there would be radical change across this room. Now, here's the reality. We, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. We don't. But I'll just say this. When I think about my, my time here on earth, and here's the deal, I'm a huge Cowboys fan. I, I am. I'm a huge Cowboys fan. And if you're a Cowboys fan, let's be honest. We wish that we had the last two minutes and 20 seconds back from that game. Right? Like even just the last play, if we could just run it again. Like when that... When that pass happened and that tackle happened, it's like, wait, that's it? Like, that, that was it. Like, I don't want to get to the end of my life, or if Jesus comes back, I don't want to be like, man, if I could only just have the last two minutes and 20 seconds or the last two months and 20 days back. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to carry any regret. But here's the thing. We, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. We just don't know. But if when you hear that question, if you hear, what if Jesus walked into the room and said he's coming back one year from today? If something in you begins to resonate and you get clarity really quickly, I would definitely start doing that. I would most certainly stop doing that. You know what? You're you're getting the luxury right now of realizing what is of greatest importance to you. Like we don't have the luxury of knowing when Jesus is coming back, but you are now experiencing the luxury of knowing what matters most. Activate on it. Don't don't just sit there and do do nothing with it. So here's my hope. My hope is that the young adults of Dallas would be a people that live like Jesus is coming back. What I want to do tonight is I want to look into the scriptures, the Holy Bible, and I want to look at a guy who lived like Jesus was coming back. He was a guy who lived with great clarity and great urgency. It's a guy named John. And John wrote five different books in the Bible. And the one that we're going to look at is the last book of the entire Bible. It's a book called Revelation. If you've ever tried to read Revelation, it's a difficult book to read. So bold move to out of the gate, first night of the spring, we're going to Revelation 1. So if you have a Bible, turn with me tonight to Revelation chapter 1. We're looking at a guy named John. John wrote Revelation. John's a pretty important figure in the Bible. If you don't know anything about the Bible, Jesus had 12 people that he spent a lot of time with, known as the 12 disciples. And then out of those 12, there were three people that he spent even more time with. John was one of them. John and his brother, Jesus called them sons of thunder. That's a pretty baller nickname. Like when Jesus gives you a nickname, you know that you guys are tight. He was one of the sons of thunder. John was the guy that at Jesus' last meal, you see John like, laying on Jesus' chest. John is the guy when Jesus is hanging on the cross, Jesus looks down and entrusts his mother to the care of John. John was the one that when he wrote his gospel, he referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, which I kind of find weird, but that's what he did. And then John got exiled to an island called Patmos, for preaching the word of God. And when he was on that island, he got a vision. And that vision is known as the book of Revelation. So that's what we're stepping into. And John was a guy who lived like Jesus was coming back. And as we look at his life, you know what we're going to see here? When we look at what he says in Revelation chapter one, we're gonna see that if you wanna live like Jesus is coming back, you need to do, you need to have three things. Number one, you need to have the right perspective. You need to live with the right perspective. Number two, you need to live with the right person. And number three, you need to live with the right posture. Usually not a big alliteration guy, but I'm just going to lean into it tonight. All right? If you want to live like Jesus is coming back, then you want to live with the right perspective. You want to live with the right person. And then you want to live with the right 
posture. Revelation chapter one, look at verse one. It just kind of gives us some information that's helpful. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That word revelation, in the original language of the New Testament, it's a Greek word, apocalypsis, which is where we get our word apocalypse. It literally means unveiling. So this book that we're looking at is an unveiling of something. It is meant to reveal something to us, which is surprising if you've ever tried to read Revelation. It feels like it's trying to conceal more than it's attempting to reveal because it's kind of hard to understand. But it says that this is the revelation or the unveiling of Jesus Christ. So here's what that means. It means that the book of Revelation reveals the person of Jesus Christ to us in a way that no other book of the Bible does. And it reveals what Jesus wants us to know in a very important way. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, to show his servants the, thing that, the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So this is John writing. And if you look at verses 2 through 8, what John is doing is he's just kind of giving a welcome. He's giving an introduction. And he says something in verse 7, which is really important. And it speaks to the first thing that we need if we're going to live like Jesus is coming back. It speaks to having the right perspective. Look at what it says in verse 7. John says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. So if you want to live like Jesus is coming back, I want to encourage you to live with the right perspective. What is the right perspective? It's the perspective that Jesus is coming back. It's not that he might come back. It's not that it's a possibility or a probability. It is that there is certainty Jesus one day, someday is with certainty he is coming back. So we want to be people who live with that perspective. Look at, look at what John says. Let's just break down verse 7. He says, behold, that's a that's a term of sight. He's saying, see, open up your eyes. Open up the eyes of your heart. See, don't be, don't be blind to reality. Behold, he, Jesus, is coming with the clouds. He's saying, Jesus Christ will come back to earth. And watch this. He says, and every, every eye will see him. Every eye will see him. My eyes will see him. Your eyes will see Jesus. Every eye will see him. What, what John is saying here is Jesus' return will be a universal return. It will have universal consequences. It will be that wide of an impact. To say that every eye will see him means that there is not one person who will be too busy with work to look up from their computer to see Jesus. No one will be too busy with their money or with sex or pleasure or anything else. No one will miss seeing Jesus. Every eye will see Jesus. It says, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And watch this, all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. That's pretty interesting. It says, all the tribes of the earth. That's another way of just repeating that his return will have a universal impact. And it says that all the tribes will wail on account of him. Do you know what that's saying? All it's simply saying is that no one will be indifferent to Jesus. When Jesus comes back and you see him, it will be the most intense moment of emotion that you have experienced to date. It will be the most intense an extreme emotion that you have experienced to date. More emotion than Justin Bieber has experienced today selling his music catalog for $200 million. More emotion than you experienced or greater than the high you experienced at that New Year's Eve party or any relationship, any sexual high, getting your bonus at the end of the year, going on that vacation, looking at the balance of your 401k, there, there is nothing 
There's no emotional high or low that you will experience that is more intense or extreme than the emotion you will experience when you see Jesus Christ. You can kiss indifference goodbye when Jesus Christ shows up. You will be at one extreme end of the spectrum. It will either be your greatest moment of joy or your greatest moment of regret. Because in that moment... Jesus will be revealed as the point of everything. Like in that moment, every person on the planet will have crystal clarity that everything has been about Jesus. All of creation has been pointing to Jesus. You exist for Jesus, to know Jesus. And so there will either be, and I hope you don't miss what I'm saying, there will either be joy, there will either be overwhelming joy in seeing the one you have been expecting, or there will be overwhelming regret in seeing the one you have been rejecting. No one will be in between. No one. No one will be in between. So here's my encouragement to you. If that is true, to live with the right perspective is to live with the understanding Jesus is coming back. So here's my encouragement. Don't wait until you see Jesus to finally see Jesus. Okay, do you hear what I'm saying? Like, if every eye will see him, including yours, including mine, then don't wait until you see him to finally see him. Because if you wait until you see him to finally see him, in that moment it will be too late. Behold him, behold him now. When I, uh, when I first started driving and I got my license, uh, a Class A restriction was placed on my license, which simply means that I have to wear corrective lenses when I'm driving. But um, I, the reason I have glasses is that I have an astigmatism in my right eye, but my left eye sees perfectly fine. And so I just learned at an early age, I could just let my left eye do the heavy lifting and I just don't need to wear glasses. So I got my license, I started driving, And I opted not to wear glasses because I thought that that Class A restriction was more of a suggestion than a necessity because my eyesight seemed perfectly fine. And so I drove for two years without corrective lenses and when I turned 18 and I had to go get my license renewed, um, I'd done so well at driving that I just assumed, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the Department of Public Safety and I'm going to take the eye test without my glasses And I'm going to show them I don't need glasses so they can remove the Class A restriction from my license. So I walked, I waited in line, got up to the counter, and the lady told me to put my face into the eye viewer and to read line three of the eye chart that was in this little viewer. Anytime you go to the eye doctor and you read a line like perfectly, maybe it's just me, but do you ever feel like a deep pride like... That was impressive, wasn't it? Like, do you ever read it and then look at the eye doctor and you're like, what's up now? Like, that's what I felt. She asked me to read line three and I would say I crushed line three. Like, I pulled my face out, kind of expecting her to be like, that was good. But instead, she looked um, confused. And she looked at me and she said, "Uh, you didn't finish. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, "You you didn't read column three. So there was three columns. She wanted me to read line three all the way across three columns. I was like, there was only two columns. She was like, no, you didn't read column three. Column three happened to be on the right side and I just happened to have an astigmatism on my right eye. So... I put my face back up to the viewer, but this time I put my left eye where my right eye went. And guess what I saw? (laughs) Column three. It was crazy. Uh, If anyone wants to go for a ride afterward tonight, happy to give you a lift home. Be a perfectly safe ride. But uh, what was interesting is that I realized in that moment that just because I couldn't see it doesn't mean it wasn't there. And the same is true with Jesus. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean that there isn't 
more to see. What's interesting is I walked out of the DPS and I still (laughs) didn't wear my glasses driving for at least another decade. Just think about what I was saying without saying it. I was basically saying, I know that there's more to see, I just don't care to see it. Here's the reality. If you're here tonight, I believe that God has, it's not an accident, I don't think it's a mistake, I think that God has brought you here to show himself to you. I believe that Jesus Christ is trying to speak into your life and reveal himself to you. Don't be a person who leaves here tonight knowing that there is more to see while being content not to see it. Don't wait until you see him to finally see him. So how do you see Jesus? Like what does it look like to cultivate spiritual sight? If Jesus is coming back and you want to have the right perspective, how do you begin to cultivate spiritual sight? Well, what you're doing right now is a great start. Like, come to the porch every Tuesday night because part of our mission is to show you Jesus. Like, if you come here and you don't get a clear picture of Jesus, we have failed. That's why the porch exists, for you to see Jesus. Come every Tuesday night. Like, I'm so encouraged by some of you here. Like, you, it, it was extremely inconvenient for you to come tonight. Like, you left work early and you're going back to work tonight. You will be on your laptop for a few more hours tonight. Some of you guys skipped dinner to be here tonight. It's amazing. So encouraging. Keep coming. Jesus will meet you here. Take his word and begin to read it. You know what? If you're new to the Bible, then my encouragement is to take another book that John wrote called The Gospel of John. It's 21 chapters. Take one chapter a day and read it. I promise you, you will begin to see Jesus. Read it with a group of friends. Begin to pray to Jesus each day. Here's a great prayer for you to pray. Jesus, I want to see more of you. Jesus, please show me more of yourself. That is a prayer that he loves to answer. Begin to see Jesus. Now, here's the thing. When you hear that Jesus is coming back one day, when we say we want to live with the right perspective because John just told us he is coming with the clouds, you know what our tendency can be in our hearts? And I feel it. Our tendency, when I tell you Jesus is coming back someday, you know what our tendency is? It's to say, yeah, he will come back someday. Like it's somewhere in the distant future. It's someday, but it won't be this day. But here's the thing. People for 2,000 years have been assuming it'll be someday, but it won't be this day. Eventually, some generation is going to be wrong because someday is going to become today and Jesus is going to come back. May it not be our generation that assumes he'll come back someday, but not today. Let's be people who live as if Jesus is coming back. Now, we don't want to just have the right perspective. We need to make sure that we have the right person. We want to live with the right person. When I say we want to live with the right person, I'm I'm basically saying we want to make sure that we have the right Jesus. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He is one of the three co-equal, co-eternal persons that exist in one, ens- in one essence as God. Do you have the right Jesus? John gets a vision in Revelation chapter 1 of the post-resurrection, post-resurrection Christ the glorified Christ. And I just want to read you his vision. It's amazing. Look at what he sees. Verse 9, it says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos. Remember, he's exiled on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, which just means that the spirit of God has taken over his mind and his heart. So he's going to begin to see Jesus visions of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book. Send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to 
Smyrna and to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. It's important that he's writing to seven churches because in the Bible, seven signifies completion. And so while he is writing this letter to seven churches, it's not just for these seven churches, it is for the complete um, group of churches of all time. So it's for this church, Watermark Community Church, for the people who come to this church. Now watch this, this is where it gets good, verse 12. It says, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. Those golden lampstands, it's a vision of the seven churches. Remember, churches exist to be lights in dark places. Churches exist to put the glory of God on display. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, that's Jesus, He's clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. So don't, don't miss what I'm telling you. We are not meant to take this vision Literally, this isn't telling us what Jesus physically looks like, but we are to take it seriously because it is informing us of who Jesus is and what his character is like. So the question is, do you know the right Jesus? Are you living with the right person? Here's, a, here's an important way for me to explain it. Okay, uh, when I was in my mid-twenties, I sat across the table from an older man. We were eating barbecue at Rudy's. And here's what he said to me. He said, T.A., here's what you need to know. Your view of Jesus will determine your response to Jesus. That's important for you to realize. Your view of Jesus will determine your, your response to Jesus. This is how all relationships work. Your view of a person determines how you respond to that person. Just watch an engaged couple. Like that guy will do anything for that girl and that girl will do anything for that guy. Like that guy will go to the store to buy feminine hygiene products for her. He'll watch the notebook with her. Like he'll do, he'll do anything for her. Why? Because he has such a big view of her. He has a big response because he has a big view. But just watch what happens when someone's view of a person changes. When their view changes, their response changes. When someone loses interest, that they... They stop responding. They start ghosting. Why? They have a small response because they have a small view. So it's good for you to just answer this question. Is your response to Jesus right now big or small? If you have a small response to Jesus right now, then here's what the issue is. The issue is that you've got the wrong Jesus. You've got the wrong Jesus. And so that's why if you want to live like Jesus is coming back, we just need to make sure that you've got the right Jesus. And John shows us the right Jesus. Look at it. Let me just unpack what some of these things mean. It says that Jesus is wearing a long robe with a golden sash. These are articles of clothing that are worn by a priest. In the Old Testament system, a priest was responsible for atoning for the sins of the nation of Israel once a year. So once a year, a priest would enter the temple of God inside this, this very special room inside the temple, and he would sprinkle blood from a sacrificed animal onto the altar to atone for the sins of the nation of Israel. Jesus is our priest because he atones for our sins, not with the blood of an animal, but with his own body and his own blood. When he went to the cross and he declared, it is finished, what was he finishing? He was finishing atoning for all of your sins and all of my sins. And when he rose from the dead, that was his declaration and demonstration that sin and death had been defeated for us. This is what Christ has done for us. And the reason that this is so important is because some of you walked in tonight carrying loads of shame because of where you've been and what you've done. I just, I, I wonder if there's anyone in the room tonight 
that walked in here thinking, I don't even belong here. Because of where I've been and what I've done, Jesus could never love me and Jesus could never forgive me. I've lied too much. I've cheated on too many people. I've cheated at work. I've stolen from others. I've had an abortion. I've lived a homosexual lifestyle. I have wronged people severely. I've bullied people in my past. I've been drunk far too many times that I could ever count. I've used too many drugs, whatever it is. You need to know that is why Jesus went to the cross. He went to the cross to deal forever with your sins in mind. He went to the cross to make a way for you and for me to be completely forgiven of our sins and to be brought into a real relationship with God. It says that the hairs of his head were, were white, like white wool, like snow. This is just talking about the, the, the wisdom and omniscience of God. Girls, when you hear that his hair was white, when you get a white hair, you either pluck it or dye it. Not Jesus, the whole hair. It's white. It's wisdom. He's, he knows everything. There's nothing that he doesn't know. And that's really important because many of you walked in here with no peace. Like the last time you experienced peace was years ago. We have no peace in our lives. We live with restlessness. We're constantly wrestling. We're constantly anxious. Why? Thinking about our future. Like, I wonder if your future causes you stress and anxiety. Am I ever going to meet someone? Am I ever going to get married? Am I ever going to finally find what I'm supposed to do with my life? Am I ever going to land in a job that is actually meaningful and satisfying and not miserable to me? Here's the thing. Jesus knows. He sees your future now. And he doesn't just see it. He's in control of it. Colossians 1.17 says that Jesus is before all things and in him all things hold together, including your life. It says that his eyes were like a flame of fire. This is speaking of the penetrating insight and discernment of Jesus. It means that nothing is hidden from his sight. He always knows exactly what is going on below the surface of every man and woman. So don't miss this. This is saying that Jesus sees below the surface into our hearts. And this is so important because so many of us just want to play religious games with Jesus. Like you're here at the porch tonight to make you feel better about yourself. Like this is, the porch is just kind of like, it's like Tylenol. It, it just kind of deals with some of the pain that you're dealing with. It's kind of a quick hit, but then you're going to kind of go and you're going to continue in brokenness this week. Let's be clear. Coming to the porch isn't what saves you. It's the Jesus that the porch proclaims that can save you. Jesus doesn't want to play religious games. He's not looking like, oh, good, you showed up to the porch. Okay, so we're good for another week. Okay, see you next Tuesday. No, he cares about your heart. He, he will not settle for anything less than a relationship that is founded upon an everlasting, unconditional love that is birthed through him. Do you know that love? It says that his feet were like burnished bronze. In the ancient world, shoes worn by soldiers were incredibly important. If a soldier didn't have the right shoes, their feet would be bloody and blistered in battle and it would impact their ability to fight. Jesus' bronze feet are stable and able to crush his enemies. This is just simply declaring that he is victorious. He is a conquering king. And that is incredibly good news because it, someone walked in tonight feeling beat up by sin. Like, I wonder if there's anyone here tonight that just feels beaten down, whipped by their sin. Like, you're drowning in your sin. Like, you're walking around in chains to your sin, whether it's porn, whether it's a sex addiction, or just consistently drinking too much, or drugs, or whatever it is. It's, it's an attachment, an unhealthy attachment to social media. It's a it's an addiction to people's approval. Maybe it's eating too much or starving yourself. I don't know what it is. 
But if you're here tonight and you feel beaten up by your sin, there is hope. And his name is Jesus, who is the victorious conquering king. I don't have an answer for you. If you're, if you're looking for a motivational speech, I'll just tell you, you know what? You can do it and just try harder and be stronger and you will overcome. I cannot assure you of that. But what I can assure you of is that Jesus Christ went to the cross and conquered your sin. Amen. And he loves you. He has fought for you. He has already won on your behalf. And he can deliver you from the power of your sin. Will you trust him to do that? It says that his voice was like the roar of many waters. The sound of our king's voice. It, it's a thundering voice communicating his power, majesty, and sovereignty. It says in his right hand he held seven stars. That just means that he's in control. It says, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. This refers to his words. Jesus' words are able to penetrate and judge those who oppose him. Let me just say this. If you're here tonight and you got tricked into being here, someone was like, let's go to happy hour, and they drove you here. <laughs> like, I'm glad you made it. But like, if you hear all this and you're like, I do not give a rip about Jesus. Let me just tell you this. You do not want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus. You will not be able to stand on your own two feet in his presence. And then it says, his face shone like the sun. Just think back to when you were a kid. Did you ever have a staring contest with the sun? Like someone dared you? You look at the sun. Some of y'all did it yesterday, but you look at the sun... <laughs> And you've got like, you've got tears kind of pouring down your face. You're beginning to see spots. It's the brilliance of the sun. You can, your, your eyes are so limited in their capacity to behold the sun for any longer than just a couple seconds. That idea is being attributed to Jesus. That if he were to walk in right now, no one would turn around and be like, no. So that's Jesus. No, we'd be like, oh my gosh, who turned the lights up? Like it would be, it, it would be blinding. Not because of his physical brightness, but because of the character of Jesus Christ, that he is the essence of beauty. He, he is overwhelmingly, breathtakingly beautiful. Do you know this beautiful Jesus that I'm talking about. Last night, sitting at the table, I've got three boys. They're 13, 11, and 5. And we've got these little, they're like flashcards. There's, they're the alphabet, and with each letter of the alphabet, there's, a, there's an attribute of Jesus. So last night was, was B, and uh, the B stood for beautiful. That Jesus is beautiful. So we went around the table and I was just asking my kids, hey, what are things in this world that you think are beautiful? And so we're talking about different things. Somehow one of them brings up like video games and screens. I'm like, it's kind of a stretch, but okay, we'll go with it. And, but at the end, to kind of pull it all together, I was like, you know what? There, there are many different things that are beautiful. Songs are beautiful. Paintings are beautiful. Pictures are beautiful. Mountains are beautiful. God threw the eternal word, who we now know as Jesus, <coughs> God, give me a second. <laughs> Just so choked up talking about beauty. <coughs> it hurts so bad. Ooh, I can do this. I can do all things for him who strengthens me. got tears in my eyes, not because of our conversation, but because it hurts right here. <clears throat> but I just told him, Jesus made beautiful things. Why? To show us his beauty. That when we would see beauty, we weren't to terminate on that and be like, that is the pinnacle of beauty, but that we would look at the mountains. We would listen to music, we would look at paintings, and we would say, that is just a hint. 
It's just a taste of the beauty of our King. Do you know that Jesus? Have you ever been captivated by his beauty? Because he is. Is this the Jesus you know? Are you living with the right person? Because here's the reality. If you listen to this description of Jesus, and something in you is like, yeah, that feels different. Then maybe you've had the wrong Jesus. If you're here tonight, I want to speak to a very specific group. If you are here tonight, and you consider yourself a Christian, but you have not been walking with Jesus, let me tell you why that is. It's because you've had the wrong Jesus. And if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you know what's happening is you're being introduced to the right Jesus for the first time. The right thing to do is to come to him. Would you come to him tonight? So we want to have the right perspective. We want to live with the right person. Then finally, we want to have the right posture. We want to have the right posture to Jesus. I know how hard it is for y'all to listen to me talk like this. I want you to see John's posture right here, verse 17. Look at what it says. Okay, I'm good. It says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I'm the first and the last. And the living one I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death in Hades. I love this. Because Jesus sees the glorified Christ and what is his involuntary response? He falls on the ground dead. He's like, there he is, I'm dead. Jesus is like, you're not dead, man, get up. <laughs> but it, the interesting thing is that this isn't, this isn't the first time that this happens in Scripture. If you go and you read through the Scriptures, you know what you see is that anytime someone sees Jesus, you know what their response is? They fall on the ground. So like Ezekiel, when he sees Jesus, look at what it says. Ezekiel 1, 28 says, Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord, and when I saw it, I fell on my face. It's like our bodies just know that when you see Jesus, you fall. It's involuntary. You don't have to tell your knees to buckle. Your, de- your knees are like, no, I, I know what to do. I see him and I fall. Is there anyone in your life that does that to you? Like they just walk into the room and you're just like, like, wow, I did not see that coming. Please forgive me. Like you walked in and I saw you and I ended up down there. No. Your body has been made to respond to only one person like that, and it's Jesus Christ. Why? Why would your knees buckle if Jesus walked through that door? Because you've been made to worship. You realize that, right? You have been made to worship. If you don't believe me, just go look at my kids. Like, my kids are made to worship. You're like, of course they have been. You're a pastor. No, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about when my kids were two years old, they worshiped Lightning McQueen, the movie Cars. Then when they got older, it was Monster Zing, Mike Kowalski. Then it was Star Wars. Then it was Jurassic World. Then it was Harry Potter. They'd move from one thing to the next. Their affection would, would be focused on one thing, then they would move on to the next. You know what our toy closet is? It is a graveyard to failed gods. Because over time, you know what happens? Is glory fades. And the thing that they thought they needed can't satisfy them like it once did. So your soul has been made to worship Jesus Christ. And your knees will only buckle for the one that they've been made to worship. And that is Jesus. So what is the right posture? Like I want you to live, not just with the right perspective or the right person, I want you to live with the right posture toward the right person. 
The right posture is one of full surrender. It's one of full surrender. That Jesus wouldn't just be a part of your life, but that he would be the point and passion of your life. Because here's the thing, when you see the right Jesus, then you realize that for Jesus to be a part of your life, but not the point of your life, is to waste your life because you've been made for him. So here's the question. How do we close the gap between completely ignoring Jesus and falling on our faces before him? Like, how do we close that gap? Well, the text tells us, look really quickly. Verse 17, it says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. He says, I'm the first and the last. So here's the thought. Jesus is saying, look, I'm I'm the first. Like, I was there in the beginning. I'm the last. I'll be there in the end. And I was there at every second in between. Like, what stands at the, the crux of history? It's the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus says, I'm the first and the last, he's just saying that everything is about me. He's the point of everything. You want to live with the right posture? (laughs) Then come to this understanding. Jesus doesn't exist for you. You exist for him. If there is only one thing you do today, if there's only one thing you do today, see Jesus, know Jesus, and help others do the same. And then look at what he says. Verse 18, it says, I'm not, he says, fear not, I'm the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death in Hades. Do you know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, if you want to experience eternal life with God in heaven when you die, it's going to have everything to do with me. He says, I hold the keys to death in Hades. When you have the keys to something, that means that you have the access You have the authority. Jesus is saying, if you're going to experience eternal life in heaven with God when you die, it will have everything to do with me. And some of y'all hear that and you're like, that's the problem with Christianity. It's so exclusive. It's so controlling. Like if I don't do everything that Jesus says, if I don't get on board with Jesus, then you're telling me that God won't save me. It's exclusive. It's controlling. It's not controlling. It's, it's loving. Why do I say that? Because tell me, what, what are you and I going to do as imperfect people to make ourselves right with a perfect God? What are we going to do? Like, what are you going to do in your own strength? What am I going to do in my own strength? An imperfect person, what could I possibly do to make myself right with a perfect God? Well, we're like, well, you know what? I just try really hard, and I I live a pretty good life, and I don't smoke too much weed, and I don't drink too much anymore. Like, I, I try and do good, but we're still imperfect, and he is perfect. If God is perfect and heaven is perfect and we are imperfect, how does it make sense for imperfect people to live in a perfect place with a perfect God? Our imperfection would make that perfection imperfection. And so what we need is a perfect God who would leave heaven and come to earth to seek and save that which was lost or imperfect. And that's what Jesus Christ has done is he has made a way for that which is imperfect to be reconciled to a perfect God. So when Jesus Christ says that he holds the keys to death in Hades, he's not trying to keep you out. All he's saying is, I I made a way in when there was no way in. When there was no way, I, I made a way. Because I love you. Do you know him? When I was doing college ministry in College Station, a ministry called Breakaway, there was, there was this, it's always good to be in the room with some Aggies. There was this girl I met named Amber, and she came from a Muslim background. She grew up Muslim. And there was this uh, volunteer with Breakaway who began to invite her to come to Breakaway, and Amber did not want to come to Breakaway. 
So this breakaway volunteer named Lauren, she just kept after her. Like, she just hounded her to come to breakaway. And finally, Amber just gave up. She's like, okay, I'll go to breakaway. So she came to breakaway. She began to hear about Jesus. She began to go to church. She began to hear about Jesus. And then Amber, this girl with a Muslim background, showed up in my office. And she articulated the good news of Christianity to me better than I had ever heard from any Christian. And then she put her trust in Jesus Christ. Do you want to know what what the pivot point was for her? It was grace. Because all of her life, she had heard about what she needed to do for God. And she got to college and she began to party. And she felt like a failure. She felt like she could no longer, she, there was no way for God to love her. And then she heard, not about what she needed to do for God, but what God had done for her in the person of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ got on a cross and died for her sins, just like Jesus died for your sins and mine. And Jesus rose from the dead, conquering sin and death for you and for me. She gave her life to Jesus. Why? Because of grace. Have you experienced that grace? Do you know this Jesus? We want to be people who live like Jesus is coming back. May we be people who live with the right perspective. May we live with the right person. May we live with the right posture. One of full surrender. So here's what I want to ask. Here's the right way to respond to this talk. Before you leave tonight, look, if you don't know Jesus, surrender to him tonight. What is keeping you from giving your life to Jesus? If you consider yourself a Christian but you haven't been walking to, with Jesus, return to Jesus tonight. And then when you get home tonight, text some of your friends and just tell them, hey, let's go all in with Jesus together. Let's live like he's coming back. And then every day this week, wake up, hit your knees, and just say, Jesus, you don't exist for me. I exist for you. You can have your way with my life. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I pray for my friends in this room who don't know you. I pray that if there's anyone in this room that does not know you, may they just sense right now that you are reaching into their life in calling them to yourself. And may they put their hope and their trust in you. And if there's anyone here tonight who has been a Christian for a long time, but they've been in a season of wandering and haven't been walking with you, I pray that they just return. That they would just feel your embrace and know your grace tonight. Thank you that you're a good king, that you love us, Lord Jesus, that you came for us. That you can be our peace because you're in control. You hold our lives in your hands. Thank you that you hold the keys to death in Hades. That brings comfort. That you're the one completely in control of our lives now and our lives even after we die. Lord Jesus, we need you. We love you. Whether you come back Someday, or you come back this day, may you find us as people who are living with complete clarity and urgency, awaiting your return.